Hi everyone, this is Tim, your Block 3 Lecture Instructor, and uh, today's voiceover PowerPoint is going to be on the lower GI tract, specifically ulcerative colitis and perforation, Crohn's disease, diverticulosis, and diverticulitis. Um, I will tell you that the PowerPoint voiceover is probably going to be about 45 minutes long. Um, this is because these four disease processes, um, there's a lot of interventions you have to do with your patients to get them better. There's a lot of testing that they do to prove the things are either getting better or worse. Um, and um, there's just a lot of information that I'm trying to um, convey to you so that we have a better understanding of these four disease processes. So try to stay with me um, and I'll try to make it as short as possible. The first disease process is going to be ulcerative colitis. It's an inflammatory disease of the bowel that results in poor uh, absorption of nutrients. Um, the reason for that is probably uh, because of the scar tissue that is caused uh, by this disease process. Um, this disease specifically, um, it's it's where the colon becomes very edematous, and because of that, it actually will cause bleeding lesions and ulcers. Um, if the bleeding lesions and ulcers become too bad, they will actually burn to the point where it will actually cause perforation of the bowel. If it doesn't actually burn and cause um, perforation, it will actually heal and um, become scar tissue. But that scar tissue loses the elasticity that it usually, you know, used to ha once have, but it also loses the ability to absorb nutrients, and that's where um, the patient who has ulcerative colitis loses their nutrients, um, loses the ability to, you know, gain weight and keep the strength, and and labs tend to be off. So it, it's it's a disease process where the absorption of nutrients is poor, but that actually kind of spirals into a lot of other problems too, and we'll go over that. Colitis, um, there's a lot of um, remissions and exacerbations. Uh, you'll have patients who will, you know, for the first time be diagnosed with it, and then they may never have it again. Um, I've had patients who, you know, this is their 20th hospital visit, and it's because of the fact that there's an exacerbation. Um, and it could be anywhere from stress to food to just, you know, they woke up in the middle of the night with just severe abdominal pain, and they know what it is, and they come to the hospital, and a lot of times they're really there for pain management and hydration. Um, but there's a difference between, you know, oh, I'm in a lot of pain, I need some drugs, as opposed to I have ulcerative colitis, I have problems, and a lot of them know not to come to the hospital until it has gone so bad that they do need pain management and hydration. So. Um, there is a difference between acute and chronic colitis. Uh, with acute, uh, this is vascular congestion. There possibly could be a little bit of hemorrhage. Uh, there's definitely going to be edema. Um, and then there's an ulceration of the bowel mucosa itself. Um, this is probably going to be more of, uh, when I say acute, more of um, an exacerbation that may have lasted for a couple of days, may have actually lasted for a week, maybe even two, uh, but they eventually get over it um, in the sense that they're no longer needing to stay in the hospital for pain management and hydration. With chronic, um, this is lifelong, um, you know, they're having to manage symptoms, they're having to manage what they eat, and they're having to manage what uh, physical activities they can actually do. <clears throat> With chronic, um, because it is so long, um, there is muscular hypertrophy um, in the intestines themselves. There's going to be fat deposits. There's going to be fibrous tissue. Uh, there's definitely going to be some uh, bowel thickening and shortening and narrowing. And this is going to be, you know, this is a process of, of a lifetime that this happens, but it is also going to be, when it happens, be a lifetime um, um, problem. Um, for an assessment of colitis, uh, there's going to be definitely anorexia because of the fact that they can't uh, absorb what they're eating. There's definitely going to be the weight loss. There's going to be malaise because they don't have the actual strength from the nutrients they could have gotten. Uh, there's going to be abdominal tenderness and cramping from the inflammation. There's going to be severe, <clears throat> severe diarrhea with blood and mucosa. Definitely malnutrition, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalances. The anemia is from the fact that they're not able to absorb what they eat. And there's also going to be a vitamin K deficiency. For interventions, um, there's going to be acute interventions, which is NPO, giving their bowel and their stomach some rest. Definitely do some fluids to be able to keep them hydrated. Uh, you're going to do some electrolyte replacement. 
Um, I also put in here TPN, and I'll, I have slides for that, which I'll go over in a bit. Um, you're going to limit activity to reduce intestinal strain. Um, you have to remember, you know, whether you get up, sit up, squat, sit on the toilet to go poop, um, anything that you do I'll, will will consist of your abdominal muscles being used to be able to do those activities. Um, because of that, that will actually cause strain and intestinal strain, and that actually exacerbates the pain. You're going to monitor bowel sounds, which should be hyperactive. You're going to monitor stools for color, consistency, and whether or not there's actually blood. Um, if there is some blood, most likely there's some sort of ulceration that has now gotten worse, and it's actually causing it to bleed. You're also looking for blood in the stools based on based based on how much there is. There put, could have actually been possibility of perforation. Um, so here's the slide for um, TPN. Um, there's there's two different types. There's a PPN, which is a partial uh, parenteral nutrition, and there's also TPN, which is the total parenteral nutrition. So with partial um, supplies are um, only part of the daily nutrition requirements. So basically, you have all the nutrition you need in a bag. And I have a picture of that here. It does come yellow. Uh, we actually kind of think of it as being more of a banana bag. Um, it's got all your electrolytes. It's got um, glucose in it. It's got, um, I mean, everything you possibly can imagine. And what they do is they'll actually test, they'll draw your blood every day to find out how your labs are looking. And based on those labs, the pharmacy will either add or subtract what they're putting into that bag to keep your, you know, potassium and your sodium and your, um, your all your electrolytes in balance, um, and so that way you're able to give your bowel a rest, but you're still able to get the nutrition that you need on a daily basis. Um, what it doesn't come with is the um, what we call lipids, uh, fat, pretty much. Um, so your body does need some sort of fat, and the picture that has the TPN, it also has the white bag, and that white bag is the actual lipids. And then uh, the total perinatal nutrition or the TPN is basically all that you need on a daily basis, whereas the uh, PPN is actually partial. Um, and it's based on severity, I guess. Um, where I work, um, and I think the book also agrees, um, but I did read some websites as I was doing the research for this PowerPoint that um, uh, PPN can actually be given through a vein. Uh, where I work, and like I said, where I think the book um, and other places I looked, um, we only put it through a central venous catheter, such as a PIC or an implanted port. Um, and that's either PPN or TPN. All of it for us actually does that. Um, I had also put a link here um, that gives you more information on it. Um, I think it's a really good thing to know as far as um, how TPN and, and PPN actually works and why your patient gets it. Um, and, and specifically, I mean, you know, you have a patient, you walk in the room, they're there for uh, colitis, they've been there for about a week, and they're, they've been NPO. They have to be able to get their nutri you know, nutrients from somewhere, and you're definitely not going to feed them. And all the maintenance fluids you gave them was doing nothing but hydration. So um, that's why they definitely need the uh, the TPN or the PPN. <clears throat> Other interventions are going to be uh, following the acute stage. Uh, diet progresses from clear liquid um, to a low fiber, low fiber, high protein, or vitamins and iron diet. Um, I say this because um, if your patient's MPO to give their bowels a rest um, and to be able to, for the inflammation to come down, eventually they're going to be put on some sort of diet. You put them on clear liquids first because it is probably the... Um, diet that has the least amount of work for your bowels to, you know, digest. I mean, if it's clear liquid, then basically your kidneys are doing all the work. Um, but once you actually tolerate that, you're finding that you're actually not having any pain and everything else seems to be going well, then you'll do the low fiber diet and then you'll do low fiber diet with protein. And then you'll do, um, you're, you're doing it in stages because, you know, at some point, if it's too much, then you're really starting all over again, and your patient does not want that. So it's kind of a st start slow and, and, and progress from there. You're going to avoid foods with um, like milk, whole wheat, grains, nuts, raw fruits, vegetables, um, pepper, alcohol, and caffeine. Um, the alcohol and the caffeine, they're vasoconstrictors, and they're also um, going to cause dehydration, so you, you definitely don't want to keep with those things. Uh, with the wheat, grains, nuts, and raw fruits, I mean, those are really just going to aggravate the uh, intestinal tract. 
uh, meds that your patient may take is going to be um, salicylate late compounds, corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, and antidiarrheals. I think I actually saw Humira as a commercial for uh, colitis, um, based on the fact that it um, could be a um, autoimmune disease process. The Humira is probably what's going to uh, help with the exacerbations. All right, so more innovations. Um, last one, I promise. So there is an important one. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to monitor for bowel perforation, peritonitis, and hemorrhage. Um, the reason why is, as the first slide had mentioned, that uh, with ulcerative colitis, this can actually cause um, lesions and ulcers. And it really just takes for that ulcer to uh, pretty much burn all the way through. Um, once it has burned through and it causes a perforation, now you actually have intestinal content in your abdominal cavity uh, where it does not belong. And that, uh, and it's also very dirty and very acidic and very, you know, there, there's all kinds of problems with that. So uh, once it perforates, you need to know what the symptoms are as far as extreme pain, um, having diarrhea, having bloody stools, um, you know, having all those that are, um, assessments because of the fact that if it does, then you need to start acting fast to be able to figure out what antibiotics they need to be on. Uh, you, need, you need to call a surgeon and have them actually come and find out where the actual uh, perforation is. They have to go in and surgically fix it. Um, your patient can actually get very septic very fast and die very quickly just based on perforation. Uh, let's see here, you're going to monitor for perforation, which I mentioned. Um, you're going to be looking for guarding um, of the abdomen, increased fever and chills. You're looking for pallor, uh, progressive abdominal distension and abdominal pain. Um, again, you're looking for pallor because of the fact that they're bleeding, so they're going to start you know, losing um, blood. You're looking for progressive abdominal distension because it went from being internally inside their intestines to now spilling out into their uh, abdominal cavity. You're going to see some restlessness, and you're also looking for uh, tachycardia and tachypnea uh, because of the fact that it is very painful. Um, if they are bleeding, you're going to be looking at you know low blood pressures and high heart rates and and breathing very quickly, and and uh, the restlessness is probably just more due to the pain than anything else. Uh, surgical interventions, uh, they can actually do total uh, proctolectomy with permanent ileostomy. Um, I've also, um, you know, I've also had patients who have had uh, colostomies or even ileostomies that have uh, been reversed. So I used to believe that they were something that you lived with for the rest of your life, um, but, you know, they cut out the area that either has a scar tissue or that's causing the pain or the problem that's been, you know, there forever because surgery is always the last option. Uh, but they cut it out, and then they actually give you either a colostomy or an ileostomy based on where that um, diseased bowel has been removed. <clears throat> All right, so the next um, disease process is Crohn's. It's an inflammatory disease that it can occur anywhere in the GI tract. So remember, colitis is more of the very, 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 very low GI tract in the large intestine. And with Crohn's, it can be anywhere from rectum all the way up until the small intestines. Um, this leads to thickening, scarring, narrowed lumen, fistulas, ulcerations, and abscesses. Assessment-wise, you're looking for fevers, which is going to be a sign of infection. You're looking for cramp-like colicky pain after meals. You're looking at diarrhea, and you're looking for mucus or pus, which is actually um, another sign of infection. You're looking for abdominal distension, uh, anorexia, nausea and vomiting. You're looking at weight loss, anemia, dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and malnutrition. So this really sounds more like Crohn's, or, or Crohn's is sounding more like colitis than anything else. So again, it's really just based on where it is in the intestinal tract. Um, but because of the fact that it's still an inflammation process, because it still can cause uh, or be caused by ulcerations and lesions and, and the scarring and the, um, the inability to actually absorb nutrients, um, you're having the same symptoms. So and it looks like the same uh, assessment uh, process too. For interventions, for acute, um, you're going to be looking at NPO, fluids, electrolytes, TPN, limit activity to reduce intestinal strain, monitor bowel sounds, monitor stools for color, consistency, and blood. So again, you're really looking at the same assessments and the same interventions for just the same two different disease processes. 
So other interventions uh, following the acute stage, you're again you're going to start off with MPO, then you're going to do a clear liquid diet and see how they tolerate it. Then you're going to go low fiber. Then you're going to go low fiber with high protein, and then you're going to be vitamins and iron. So again, you're really just starting slow, going from NPO to clear liquids, and just progressing to there. <clears throat> again, you're going to avoid the uh, foods like uh, milk, whole wheat, grains, nuts, raw fruits, vegetables, peppers. Uh, alcohol and caffeine, and you're going to take meds such as the uh, salicylate late compounds, corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, and antidiarrheals. For diagnostics, they're going to do an x-ray. They could possibly do a CT scan. They're going to do something called a leukocyte uh, scintography, which is a white blood cell count um, uh, scan, and this is because white blood cell counts indicate inflammation. So um, it's they're looking for inflammation. They're looking for possible signs of infection. They also can do a colonoscopy and an endoscopy um, just to see if there's. Um, they're basically going inside and looking around. They could do an MRI or possibly an ultrasound. All right, so Crohn's and surgery. Surgery may be necessary, but is avoided for as long as possible because of the recurrence of the disease process in the same region is likely to occur. Um, just like with uh, colitis, it basically it's going to be a, um, you know, you're having a problem, you can, you're being diagnosed, and you either can have it again um, uh, as an exacerbation, or you may have remissions. Um, it, it could last anywhere from days to weeks to months to you know whatever. So it's really more of you learning how to control the symptoms, and um, and I hate to say this, but pretty much learn you know learn to live with the problems. Um, with Crohn's, um, again, we're looking at two pictures here. Um, you know, they're looking at inflammation, and again, if it keeps recurring, uh, but they just don't want to do surgery because now you're you're creating a whole other problem as far as you know you're re reattaching parts of the bowels, you're possibly having to need some sort of ileostomy or colostomy bag, um, you're having um, intestinal contents that are now you know, possibly able to infect other areas of the body, and, and that's just what they don't want. Um, <clears throat> Here's a picture of the inflammatory bowel disease. We've got a healthy, um, you know, bowel section on the far left. And then with Crohn's disease, um, we actually have, um, you know, fat wrapping around the actual um, intestine itself with muscle hypertrophy, fissures, and cobblestone appearances. And then with ulcerative colitis, basically, it's it's breaking down that um, you know, mucosal layer that's uh, eating way through it and, and causing um, the pain and possibly, again, perforation. Last two, diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Um, diverticulosis is an outpouching or herniation of the intestinal mucosa. Can occur anywhere in the GI tract, but most common in the sigmoid colon. With diverticulitis, it's the inflammation of one or more diverticula that occurs from penetration of fecal matter results in local abscess formation and perforation. It's intra-abdominal perforation, which is generalized peritonitis. And I believe there is a picture right here. So uh, with, uh, with diverticulitis, um, basically it's a ulcer that has formed. And with diverticulosis, it's actually in the process of being formed. For an assessment, we're looking at uh, low left lower quadrant abdominal pain that increases with coughing, straining, and lifting because you're using those abdominal muscles. <clears throat> you're also looking at elevated temperature because the fact that you're now looking at the possibility of, um, of abscesses and infection in those pouches. You're going to have nausea and vomiting. You're going to have flatulence. You're going to have crap cramp-like pain, abdominal distension and tenderness, and blood in the stools because of the uh, ulcers found in the uh, diverticulitis. For diagnostics, they're going to do a CT scan. They're also definitely going to be doing a colonoscopy. They're going to go up there, they're looking around to find out exactly where those ulcers are, where those pouches are uh, inflamed, and if they've actually um, either have some sort of pus um, inf an infection in them, or if they've actually busted and uh, there's going to be some sort of bleeding. 
Um, as far as lab-wise, they're looking for inflammatory markers, which is the white blood cell count, and they're also looking for C-reactive protein levels. Um, the higher it is, the more um, in possible infection or inflammation that they have. Interventions, it's going to be provide bed rest. Um, you're definitely going to have them NPO. Um, you don't want anything going in. You don't want anything to have to come out. Um, you can do clear liquids eventually, and that's probably going to be because of the fact that the kidneys will process them, and uh, as long as your kidneys are functioning correctly, then you're not only getting hydration, but you're also at least getting something in you. Um, you can eventually be progressed to a fiber diet. Um, you're going to monitor for perforation, hemorrhage, fistulas, and abscesses. You're going to increase the fluid intake um, from 2,500 to 3,000 ml a day. Um, the reason why is two things. One, you're um, allowing your patient to be hydrated, but you're also trying to flush out your intestinal tract. Um, and you're doing that by you know, consuming fluids. Can you process them? You're overly hydrated. Um, it can actually push it where it needs to go, and your body is already in the process of trying to get rid of whatever is ailing it anyways. You eventually can uh, progress to a soft, high-fiber uh, diet uh, with whole grains, but nothing uh, during the inflammation. The reason why is the inflammation will cause things to be trapped, and that's going to cause more pain and more problems. You're going to avoid gas-forming foods. You're going to avoid things such as uh, nuts and seeds. Um, they get trapped in this diverticula and they cause inflammation. Um, you're going to eat a small amount of bran daily for stool forming and increased stool masses. Um, you want things to kind of bind together and for it to constantly move. Um, the more things bind together, the more as it moves, it picks up other stuff. Um, when I was in nursing school, I think one of the things they told us absolutely to avoid is like strawberries, things that actually have seeds that are almost microscopic to where, you know, they... I mean, if you if you ate it, <clears throat> if you ate a strawberry with a really really small seed that they do have, I mean, come on, you already know it's going to be stuck in some sort of crevice. So, um, I think what you're really trying to do is again, you're trying to eat things that are easily digestible, big enough for them not to get stuck anywhere. You're you're trying to do some sort of brand or uh, metamucil or something that will actually form the stool and for it to move as easily as possible, and again, try to pick up stuff along the way. Other surgical interventions, they can also do the colon resection. You can also do temporary or permanent colostomies, which I mentioned before. Um, again, you're really cutting out the area that is either the most diseased, the most uh, inflamed, or the most scarred. And uh, again, you're you're going to you're going to put in a colostomy until things really calm down and things really start to heal and, and work for you. Um, and then again, they can actually uh, possibly reverse it, putting it all back together. Uh, for med medication, you're going to do uh, ciprofloxacin or Cipro, which is an antibiotic because of the abscesses. Um, you're also going to possibly do Flagyl, which is another antibiotic for specifically the bowels. Um, I call it the good bacteria antibiotic. Uh, you're definitely going to do pain meds, which is going to be morphine and dilated, um, not necessarily together. Um, and your patient may not necessarily need dilated, but um, patients who have some sort of GI uh, problem that they've had all their life tend to go from being on something you know low and um, and something that will work for their pain to eventually needing something that's actually much better. Um, they're also going to need something uh, for nausea and vomiting, which is going to be the Zofran. If that doesn't seem to work, then they can also do fenugreek. <clears throat> All right, the last one is going to be bowel obstruction. Um, a common type of obstruction or blockage um, is called fecal impaction. Fecal impaction is when a large, hard mass of stool gets stuck in your digestive tract and can't be pushed out the normal way. When the bowel is blocked by something other than hard stools, doctor calls, doctors call it a uh, bowel obstruction. Other causes can be uh, from twisted um, intestines, um, herniated, tumors, um, blood vessels, and muscle walls become paralyzed. So there's a million reasons why you can actually have this bowel obstruction. Assessment-wise, you're going to be looking at a physical exam. Uh, you're also going to do a, um, a health history exam, such as, you know, are you taking pain medication, which slows everything down? If things slow down, then eventually you get constipated, and that's where you get your small bowel obstruction. Uh, are you drinking enough water? Because the more dehydrated you are, the uh, drier everything seems to get, including your stools, and that will cause things just to stop and sit. 
And then whether or not you're physically active, you know, patients um, or people in general that are not not physically active, that sit or lay for long periods of time, things, again, will start to slow down and stop, and that's where you get constipated. Um, let's see here, you're also looking at constipation, uh, no flatulence, because if, if gas is moving, usually everything else in your body is moving too. You're also looking for stomach cramps, uh, which can come and go. You're looking for nausea and vomiting, diarrhea. I think so the biggest thing is that, you know, based on homeostasis, what goes in, your body naturally wants to have, have come out. Uh, so if you have a small bowel obstruction, you keep continuously eating food or consuming something, um, there's nowhere for it to actually go. Um, your body's reacting to that by actually getting nauseous, having, uh, you know, emesis. <clears throat> Or what it will possibly do is actually pull as much fluid into the bowel as it possibly can to soften it up to get rid of it. And if it can't do that, it will soften whatever else is around it and then cause it to pass. Your body is trying to take care of itself the best way it can. Uh, you're also going to have abdominal distension, and this is because of the fact that either things are backing up or your body is actually um, collecting enough fluid to try to get it to move. And again, it doesn't really know that it's not working. It's just trying to do the best it can to get it to move. For diagnostics, um, we can do an x-ray and they also do a CT scan. Uh, I put these two pictures up here because I thought they were pretty good um, indications of small bowel obstructions. I never really had heard of the string of pearls before, but uh, but I have actually seen something that looks similar to that. So, um, but you, on these two pictures, you can actually see where where stool is actually just setting. It's, it's not moved and it's basically, um, you know, it's basically stuck. <laughs> Um, interventions. You're going to do an NG tube, and this is to actually give the bowels a rest. Um, so your body, specifically your stomach, produces gastric content to be able to break things down when you eat and digest. Um, it doesn't actually ever stop producing that. Um, with small bowel obstructions, your body will try to do what it can to get that to move. So whether it pulls fluid back into the actual intestines to help break it down to get it to move, whether it's your body produces more gastric content and, and acid to help break it down, um, it's going to do whatever it can. Because of the gastric content will increase to help move it, even though you're not eating or drinking anything, it's still being produced and that actually will cause you to be more nauseous and have vomiting, but you're just vomiting more, you know, stomach acid. The NG tube, which will start in your nose, go down your throat, and into your stomach, will be able to, you know, whether it be pull, put on low intermittent suction or full suction, it's going to suck all that stuff out. And it's doing that so that way it gives one, you know, your body a rest. It also relieves the nausea and vomiting, and it actually sucks out the, um, the gastric content. Because if you go back to the other PowerPoints, gastric content that's there, that's not doing what it needs to do, will actually cause ulcers and it will cause the, uh, the mucosal lining of the stomach to actually break down. So the NG tube is really there to help suck all that gastric juice out so that way it doesn't actually cause other problems and it does give your bowels a rest. Uh, your patient is definitely going to be NPO. Um, this is also to give their bowels a rest. Um, and again, what just remember, what goes in has to come out. So there's no point of feeding somebody who has a bowel obstruction because it's not going to go anywhere. If it is, it's going to be because of diarrhea. You can actually progress to clear liquids um, if you need to or if they actually tolerate them. Um, again, you're not going to have somebody who's on an NG tube sucking out the, the gastric contents but then put them on a clear liquid diet because what goes in is still going to be sucked out. <clears throat> and you're also sucking out the GI, you know, um, the you know acids at the same time. So it's one or the other. Now, your patient can actually be put on clear liquids with having an NG tube, but you're going to turn the NG tube off and put them on clear liquids to see how they do. Um, so they're getting nauseous and vomiting, then guess what? You turn it back on, you suck it all back out, and then they feel better. Uh, pain medication. So uh, you're going to, you know, possibly give them the Dilaudid or the morphine for their pain. But then again, the side effect of pain medication is constipation. So you now have a patient who has a small bowel obstruction, which is essentially constipation because uh, things are not moving. And then you're causing more constipation because of the fact that you're giving something more for pain. But you get able to balance it out and you want them to be pain-free um, and all the while, um, you know, 
at moving their small bowel obstruction. Uh, for hydration, you're going to do uh, normal saline at 0.9%. Uh, um, that's because um, it's going to cause more fluid into the system for it to be overly hydrated and then allow them to try to break down that small cell bowel obstruction and pass it. Um, so here's how the NG tube works. So basically you're going to measure from their nose to the earlobe and from the earlobe down to the uh, xypho process. Um, once you've measured that far, then you know that you can actually put the NG tube up their nose down their throat, into their stomach, and uh, based on that measurement, it will actually go where this picture shows, which is the middle of the stomach. And again, it's designed to actually suck up the content. Um, it's not an easy process. Um, it's an, a skill that is not hard to do, but in the same sense too, it is hard because you're trying to put a tube up someone's nose, down their throat, into their stomach. You're hitting all kinds of stuff. One, you're sticking up somebody's nose to the point where it starts to make them wince and their eyes will water. And then once it gets to the back of their throat, you're trying to push it down. And of course, you're now pushing something down their throat, which is making them gag and choke. All the while, you're trying to make them, you know, tilt their head forward into their chest because that causes the epiglottis to cover the trachea um, and for the tube to easily go into their stomach. Um, if that doesn't necessarily work real well, then it will end up in their lungs and then they'll start gagging and choking and now they can't breathe and all kinds of problems. So it's, it's easy, but then it's not. Um, and it's really hard when you either your patient is completely alert and oriented because they know what's going on, um, or it's even harder when they're not alert and oriented, they're confused um, because now they're not able to follow instructions. Or if you have a patient who is actually unconscious, it's even pretty bad because now, again, they can't follow any instructions at all. So, uh, but we will actually have this as a lab and it's, um, it's a skill that I actually, I don't enjoy doing, but I find that it's a skill that uh, it takes a little bit of precision and, um, and once you've got it down, it's actually pretty easy. Um, one thing I think I was just thinking about as I was talking, um, two things. One, you can, um, the old way of checking placement was to place a stethoscope over the stomach um, and listen as you're pushing air into the NG tube and you'll hear the gurgling of the uh, gastric juices and the air mixing. That was the old way. That was probably, I mean, it was something that more seasoned nurses were taught how to do. Um, now they're actually saying that you need a uh, chest x-ray to verify placement. And it is true. Um, I think that for the most part, they've had too many uh, problems where nurses have placed NG tubes. They've been in the lungs and either you're turning it on high suctioning. Now you're actually causing damage to the lungs. Or you can also use the NG tube as a tube to administer uh, fluids and um, um, tube feedings. Um, so the problem you run into is if you don't know exactly where it is and someone has actually verified based on a chest x-ray and you, it's in the lungs, you're putting tube feedings, you're putting fluids, you're putting all kinds of stuff in this tube thinking it's in the stomach and essentially it's in the lungs and now you're filling the lungs full of stuff. So, And that's happened way too many times. So this is really, uh, the chest x-ray is to really make sure that it's really truly where it's supposed to be. Um, so appendicitis, uh, inflammation of the appendix, uh, it's where the appendix actually becomes infected, inflamed, and it actually could rupture. Uh, this leads to peritonitis and sepsis because, again, you're now having a part of the bowels that uh, was supposed to be completely encapsulated. Uh, to now there's an open space where um, intestinal stuff uh, can leak out, and that leaks out into your peritoneal area. It causes uh, definitely the sepsis and the peritonitis. <clears throat> Assessment-wise, uh, pain in the peri-umbilical area that descends to the right lower quadrant, abdominal pain of the McBurney's point. And this link actually takes you to YouTube where um, a person showing you how to actually do that assessment. Um, and so um, most of your appendicitis patients are going to be roughly 18 years to maybe early 30s, maybe late 20s. Um, but I've actually had, you know, like 80 year olds with, uh, with an appendicitis. Um, but I've always seen the doctors actually come and they actually do this assessment. And it's a pretty sure way of actually determining if it's an appendicitis or an appendix problem than anything else. 
System-wise, you're also going to have rebound tenderness. You're going to have a low-grade fever. You're going to have increased blood blood cells. Uh, you're going to have anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Patient on their side laying position with abdominal guarding and legs flexing. Um, basically, this is because of where it is allows them to uh, feel a little more comfortable. Here's a wonderful picture of a um, diseased appendix. Um, when I actually found the picture, I think it looks like something my cat threw up, um, but it isn't very big, um, and and they just go in, they remove it. Um, they either can remove it laparoscopically, which is basically three um, um, Basically, it's almost like three individual knives that really go in. They cut the appendix uh, out, and then they basically cut it in little pieces, and they just pull it through three puncture sites. Or they also could do an open um, um, incision where they cut you um, down you know, more towards like groin site and along your leg and actually go in and remove it that way. It's really based on how inflamed it is and whether they, they can get to it easily or not. Pre-op wise, you're going to make sure your patient is NPO. Uh, you're going to give them IV fluids for hydration. You're also going to control their pain with um, something IV. And uh, again, you're going to have them on their right side laying for comfort. Um, OR wise, again, they're going to either do it laparoscopically or they're going to do it open. Um, if they do it laparoscopically, you have to remember to teach your patient that, especially living in Arizona, most of us have pools. And uh, you know, after a couple of days, they're actually going to feel pretty good and things will start to heal but they can't do any baths they can't do any jacuzzis they can't do any lakes they can't do any swimming they can't do anything there is actually freestanding water and the reason why is because they're going to go you know get into this water those three puncture sites will actually fill up and now you've actually got um, whatever fluid you were in is now going to be inside you and that causes a lot of uh, infection. <clears throat> They're not allowed to do that for at least two weeks until it's completely healed. Um, the only thing that's actually covering these pre-puncture sites is really just steri strips. Um, and again, it will heal over time. They just don't need to go home, lay by the pool for a couple days, relaxing, trying to recover, and go. Okay, well, I'll get in the pool just to cool off. And like again, you're now, you know, smerging themselves in dirty water. Uh, let's see here, you're going to monitor bowel sounds after um, having the surgery because bowel sounds are an indication that things are actually waking up and starting to move so they can actually start to tolerate a diet. Um, you don't want to do any heat. Um, you want to apply ice for inflammation. Uh, for antibiotics, they're, going to, they're probably going to send you home or give you antibiotics while you're in the hospital, and uh, one of them is Zosin. This is actually a antibiotic that is very specific to uh, abdominal surgeries, um, and this is to help kill all the bacteria if there is something that did leak out of the bowels um, and keep you from getting sick. You definitely want, don't want to do any laxatives or enemas um, because you're still trying to heal. And the laxatives, um, you don't want to have to put your your bowels through something where it's had surgery. And laxatives actually cause, um, you know, obviously fluid to move very quickly, and uh, you just don't want to put that stress on, uh, on your bowels. More GI meds. Uh, there's lactobacillus, which is a good bacteria, because again, your patient is going to be probably on something prophylactically to keep them from getting some sort of uh, infection. Uh, but antibiotics will also kill off good bacteria, so you give lactobacillus for that to, you know, counteract it. You can do stool softeners to get things moving again. You just don't want the laxatives because it's too harsh. Uh, stimulants, um, it, they pull the water into the intestines and they cause the diarrhea. Um, the diarrhea necessarily is not a bad thing, but in the same sense too, I think it's the way that it works and as fast as it works. I mean, you go from, you know, you want to be able to sit down, you want to be able to go without actually having to push. I mean, you've, you've just had abdominal surgery. They're going through skin. They're going through muscle. They're getting to the intestines. You don't want to have to strain to go, but in the same sense, too, you don't want to be able to have to sit down and literally things are just trying, you know, screaming out of you, trying to, to be able to go because it's also very hard on the intestines and uh, the way things move. 
Uh, Mag citrate, which is a very good stimulant that actually works. Uh, Reglin is a medication that we tend to give people to help stimulate their appetite, um, and it also um, increases peristalsis. So if you have a patient who is um, who has had surgery and their bowels are still asleep, uh, the Reglin can help kind of wake them up a little bit. <clears throat> and that's it. Not too bad. 40 minutes. Um, I know it's a lot of information, but again, it really is more of, um, of doing some sort of testing to prove symptoms, and you're going to do assessments in order to find out which direction that they're going. They're going to do a lot of scopes in order to prove what they think is actually happening, and again, they're not going to do surgery until your patient has had this for a very long time, and there's no other option, um, just because we're looking at, you know, colostomies, oleostomies, um, you know, um, incisions and things like that. So they're really looking more for um, management of symptoms and disease process as opposed to uh, going in there and surgically trying to fix it. So if you have any questions, let me know.